Hi, this week's First Chapter Friday is Making Bombs for Hitler by Marsha Forchuk Skripik. And this book is a historical fiction story, and it is um, a Holocaust story. And this today's Holocaust Remembrance Day. So I wanted to, I thought this would be a good um, example of a book that you could read to learn more about the Holocaust. And I think um, that the kind of more unique thing about this book is that um, it's about um, some children who were not Jewish, who were captured by the Nazis from um, the Soviet Union and the part of the Soviet Union that is now Ukraine. And this is a thing that really happened that um, the Nazis did go into um, the Soviet Union and capture children and young people and take them to Germany and made them work um, in the factories and in the work camps. So another just really horrible thing that happened in Nazi Germany. And I know that this is a book that's got some really sad things in it and some things that are really hard to hear and hard to read. Um, I'm going to keep it a little bit, I'm not going to go too far into the book. Um, and I'm going to, you know, sort of put that trigger warning out there. If, if this book is something that would be difficult for you to read, then put it aside and, you know, maybe read it when you're a little older. But the the kind of purpose of days like Holocaust Remembrance Day is to make sure that we don't forget what happened, that these things really happen and that these are people's real life experiences and these horrors, um, if they're forgotten, could happen again. So we need to make sure that we keep the um, memories out there so that we can prevent anything so wretched from ever happening again in our world. Um, hopefully never happening again. So I'm going to read a little bit of um, just the very, very beginning of this book, Making Bombs for Hitler. Chapter One, Losing Larissa, 1943. The room smelled of soap and the light was so white that it made my eyes ache. I held Larissa's hand in a tight grip. I was her older sister after all, and she was my responsibility. It would be easy to lose her in this sea of children, and we had both lost far too much already. Larissa looked up at me and I saw her lips move, but I couldn't hear her words above the wails and screams. I bent down so that my ear was level with her lips. Don't leave me, she said. I wrapped my arms around her and gently rocked her back and forth. I whispered her favorite lullaby into her ear. A loud crack startled us both. The room was suddenly silent. A woman in white stepped in among us. She clapped her hand sharply once more. Children, she said in brisk German. You will each have a medical examination. <clears throat> Weeping boys and girls were shoved into a long snaking line that took up most of the room. I watched as one by one kids were taken behind a broad white curtain. When it was Larissa's turn, her eyes went round with fright. I did not want to let go of her, but the nurse pulled our hands apart. Lita, stay with me. I stood at the edge of the curtain and watched as the woman made Larissa take off her nightgown. My sister's face was red with shame. When the woman held a metal instrument to her face, Larissa screamed. I rushed up and tried to knock that thing out of the nurse's hand, but when the nurse called for help, someone held me back. When they finished with Larissa, they told her to stand at the other end of the room. When it was my turn, I barely noticed what they were doing. I kept my eyes fixed on Larissa. She was standing with three other girls. Dozens more had been ordered to stand in a different spot. When the nurse was finished with me, I slipped my nightgown back on. I was ordered to stand with a larger group, not with Larissa's. I need to be in that group, I told the nurse, pointing to where Larissa stood, her arms outstretched, a look of panic on her face. The nurse's lips formed a thin, flat line. No talking. She put one hand on each of my shoulders and shoved me toward the larger group. A door opened wide. We were herded out into the blackness of night. Larissa screamed, Lita, don't leave me. I looked back into the room but could not see her. I will find you, Larissa, I shouted. I promise, stay strong. A sharp slap across my face sent me sprawling onto the cold, wet grass. I scrambled up and tried to break through the sea of children. I had to get back to Larissa. Strong arms wrapped around my torso and lifted me up. I was thrown into blackness. With a screech of metal, the door slammed shut. Blackness. I dreamed that I was lying in a sea of humming bees. We were swaying back and forth, and I sang the lullaby under my breath, 
imagining that I was being rocked in Mama's arms. I opened my eyes. It was so dark they took a few minutes to adjust. I was crammed inside a hot metal room that smelled like a dirty barn. It was so stuffy and stinky and crowded that I could barely breathe. I realized with a shock that we were moving. This was not a room after all, but a train car, the kind for cattle. It swayed back and forth. The sound was not the humming of bees, but the whispers of frightened children and the thrumming of the train on its tracks. At least the sound of war was muffled out. Does anyone know where we're going, I asked. The whisper stopped. A lone, thin voice answered, to Germany, I think. My heart sank. If they took me to Germany, how would I ever find Larissa? Wherever she was, she must be so frightened, so alone. I tried to stand, but the, with the movement of the car and the hazy light, I fell backward, one of my bare feet landing on a girl's chest. Ow, she cried. I'm sorry. It was pointless to try standing, so I sat up and tried to get my bearings. In the dim light, I could see a tangle of limbs and tufts of hair. Kids were packed in so tightly that they each overlapped the next. Something smelled bad, and a sloshing sound came from one corner. What is that over there? I asked no one in particular. That's our bathroom, said the girl I had stepped on, a pail. I wrinkled my nose. All these people in one pail for a bathroom? No wonder it smelled so bad. I crawled as far away as I could get from the stinky pail, moving slowly and being careful not to hurt any of the kids who were crammed in my way. When I got to the other side of the car, I saw there was a thin seam of light framing the panel in the siding. It was a door. I pounded and screamed with all my might. The children who were propped up against it scooted to the side. It won't do you any good, the bo a boy, said a boy's voice. We've already tried to open it. I looked over to him in the dim light and saw a silhouette of wild hair. There was a trickle of dark on his cheek. Was he bleeding? Using the ridges in the siding to help me balance in a standing position, I felt a long lever across the door. I pushed down hard. It moved and sprang back up, but the door didn't open. It's locked from the outside, a girl's voice said. I pounded on it again with my fists. Nothing happened. The wild-haired boy looked up at me and said, Even if it did open, what would you do then? Fall out onto the train tracks in the middle of nowhere? I slid back down and sat beside him, wrapping my arms around my knees and staring at my feet. Was Larissa in a cattle car like this going somewhere else? How would I find her? What was happening to me? In the dark monotony, we exchanged names with those who sat closest to us. The wild-haired boy was Luka Barukovich from Kiev. Sitting beside him was Xenia Chornich, also from Kiev. The girl I had stepped on was Marika Steshin from Babin, not far from my village of Verenchenka. The thin seam of light around the door frame was my only marker of time. It dimmed, then darkened. I slept. In that space between day and nightmare, my body swayed with the chug, chug, chug of the boxcar. One girl chanted prayers in a voice hoarse from crying. Gradually, the seam around the door got light again. Daytime stretched out in endless minutes. I was hungry, thirsty, hot. Weren't we all? A second night passed. Would we all die in this cattle car? A loud screech and we came to a halt. The door slid open. I would have fallen out had I not grabbed onto Marika, who was curled in fitful sleep on my lap. The sudden daylight hurt my eyes and the whoosh of cold filled my lungs with what felt like a thousand tiny pins. I propped myself up and squinted, trying to make sense of what I saw outside the cattle car. A young Nazi soldier with a face a rash of pimples pointed a rifle at Luca. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. My mouth and throat were like sawdust. Behind the soldier stood some sort of train depot or maybe a town. I couldn't tell for sure. There were wooden buildings that were mostly still standing and sad looking people milling about. The only signs that I could see were written in German. A high pitched whizzing sound was followed by a boom. In the distance, a puff of smoke, bombs. Stay in there, Russian swine, screamed the boy soldier in German, jabbing his rifle menacingly. Why was he calling us Russian? We were Ukrainian, all of us. And why were we pigs? I didn't dare ask. The Nazi turned and motioned to someone we could not see. 
A door opened on one of the buildings and a hollow cheeked woman in rags appeared behind him. Balanced on her shoulders was a long stick with a sloshing tail attached to either end. She paused beside him awaiting further instructions. He flicked his hand impatiently at her, indicating that she should set the pails inside our car. Be useful or they will kill you, the woman whispered it to us urgently in Ukrainian, lifting one pail into our car and pushing it against our legs. It was filled with water. No talking, shouted the soldier. Why did he have to shout? He aimed his rifle at the woman. Her fearful eyes darted to him. She lifted up the second bucket and Luca grabbed the handle. We all pushed back so there was room to set it on the floor. This bucket was filled with a gray, watery sludge. The door clanged shut and we were engulfed in darkness once again. The train jolted, then picked up speed. I moved on my hands and knees over to the sludgy pail and sniffed. It had a dank smell that reminded me of the rotting vegetable scraps Mama would use to fertilize our garden when we still had a home. In other circumstances, the smell might have turned my stomach but it had been so long since any food had passed my lips that my stomach rumbled in anticipation. I dipped one finger in, lukewarm. I tasted it. This is some sort of soup. There were no spoons or bowls, so we took turns crawling over to the pail and carefully scooping out a bit of the muck with cupped hands. In the handful that was mine, I could feel a chunk of turnip with my tongue, but otherwise it was mostly water. I chewed the turnip slowly and swallowed it down, the wet mush feeling like a bomb on my dry throat. My eyes were getting used to the dimness of the car, so I watched as the others lined up and swallowed down their meager share of soup. Marika didn't get in line. She didn't even sit up. I crawled over to her and placed my hand on her forehead. It was cool, too cool, to the touch. Food, Marika, you've got to eat. I gently shook her shoulder. Her eyes opened slightly, and I thought for a minute that she looked at me, but they quickly fluttered shut. I went back to the pail of watery turnip soup, nudging my way to the front of the line. Marika needs something to eat. The kids closest to the pail made room for me, and I scooped up as much of the solid bits as I could with my hands. It wasn't easy getting back, with the rail car swaying, the darkness, and the other kids. But each time I nearly fell, one of the others would steady me. Luca and Xenia propped Marika up between them. I knelt in front of her and held my cupped hands to her face. Her nose wrinkled. Perhaps her dreams were more pleasant than the smell of those vile bits of turnip. Her eyes opened and she looked down. Eat. She cupped her fingers over mine and drew my hands to her mouth. She swallowed a piece of soggy turnip and choked. Slowly. She held my hands close to her mouth as if she were afraid I wouldn't give her any more but she carefully chewed every bit of turnip and swallowed it down. She licked my fingers, then pushed my hands away and slumped back into Xenia, exhausted. There was barely any soup left for Luca, the last in line. We reversed the order for water, so at least Luca got a few good swallows. With a little bit of food in my stomach and water to wet my lips, I felt stronger. I wondered what the woman meant, be useful or they will kill you, I asked Luca. We are too young to be of much use to the Nazis, Luca replied, and useless people are killed. The words were like a stone in my heart. If I was too young to be useful, what about my little sister? What could Larissa ha do to prove herself useful? How could I save her? First, I would have to figure out a way to save myself. What work could I possibly do, I asked. Figure out a skill, said Luca, and say you're older. How do you know about this? Lucas sighed. This isn't the first time I've been caught by the Nazis. So that's the first chapter of Making Bombs for Hitler. You can find this book in the historical fiction section of our library. And there's lots of other books um, about the Holocaust as well, if you would like to read about that and learn a little bit more about something that was a, a hard history, but um, an important history to remember um, on this sad anniversary.